Hello, and welcome to the problem-solving set on the LAC operon. Question 1 asks us to describe how the inducer works in an inducible operon such as LAC. So the inducer in this case is allolactose. Now, allolactose is just an isomer of lactose. And an isomer means that they have the same molecular formula, but different arrangement of atoms. So that gives it a different structure and therefore a different function. So here, the allolactose binds allosterically to the repressor protein. And this binding to the repressor protein actually changes the 3D conformation of the repressor and makes it inactive. So binds to the repressor, 3D conformation change to inactivate the repressor. So now if you have lac operon, you have the promoter, the operator, and then the structural genes. I think the order is ZYA. Those are the genes. So now, this inactive protein, so let's say if this is the normal repressor protein, it can go right over and just block the operator, right? But let's say if allolactose comes in, I'll draw it as little black triangles. Let's say it binds to the operator, and now the operator is going it's going to have allolactose bound to it, but let's just say now it changes the conformation and now it looks like a rectangle. And now it's not going to fit correctly on the DNA of the operator, and so it can't bind. So now, with the operator free, RNA polymerase can come over to the promoter, and it can go ahead and transcribe this operon. So effectively, allolactose coming in, which you know has to isomerize from regular lactose coming into the cell, inactivates the repressor protein, and turns on this operator, okay? So it's the operator's free, the promoter can bind to RNA polymerase, and everything is turned on. So another, I, I explained isomers a little bit, another word you may um, need a definition of is this term allosterically. So allosteric binding means um, at a different place. So you know that enzymes have an active site, right, where they bind their substrate. So in this case, this repressor protein has an active site for the DNA in the operator. An allosteric site is somewhere away from this active site. So allolactose in this case binds somewhere other than the active site, and it's sti but it still affects binding because it changes the 3D conformation. Okay, so it's just something simple. Um, I could draw it out if you want. So let's say that the normal enzyme looks like this, and this is the active site where it normally binds substrate. An allosteric binding would be if another molecule came over and binded and bound was bound over there. Okay, so that's allosteric binding. And that's, in a nutshell, how the inducer works in this LAC operon. Problem 2. The lac operon of E. coli contains three structural genes that are required for the utilization of lactose as an energy source. Two of these genes encode for proteins whose function are known. Name the two genes and describe the purpose of their gene product. Okay, so this is a, just a little illustration. If they're lac Z, lac Y, and lac A are the three different structural genes of this lac operon. Okay, so lac Z encodes for a protein called beta-galactosidase. Okay, and this enzyme functions by cleaving the disaccharide lactose into its monosaccharide subunits of glucose and galactose. Cleaves lactose into glucose and galactose. So I'm not sure if you'll need to know the specifics of this for your course or maybe organic chemistry or biochemistry. Um, but you have the two sugars 
and they're connected. I don't know exactly where they're connected, but usually there's. <coughs> it's going to look like something like this, and beta galactosidase would cleave over here. Okay, and into its two monosaccharide single sugar subunits. The next structural gene is LACY, and that encodes for beta galactoside permease. Or as you'll see at some places, and even in the later problems, this is what's known as lactose permease. And this is the enzyme that goes to the cell membrane and actually transports lactose into the cell. And I know they were only talking about these two in the problem, but we do know the enzyme that LAC-A encodes is called beta-galactoside transacetylase. So, its function is not entirely known. Um, obviously, it does transfer, transfer acetyl groups between molecules during the utilization of lactose. But, you know, for now, we could say its function largely unknown because they weren't exactly asking for this. So, those are the three structural genes of the LAC operon. Um, you'll see in later problems, they'll ask if certain ones are transcribed in certain scenarios. Just remember that in operons, these three structural genes are grouped together. So if the operon is on and the transcription is on, all three of these will be transcribed, okay? Because remember that it's going to make a polycystronic mRNA. That has the mRNA for all three of these genes. Problem three. Glucose is the preferred energy source for E. coli, and a bacterium is, equi is equipped to use up the supply of glucose first, even if multiple sources are available. The second messenger, cyclic AMP, or CAMP, is an important molecule in this mechanism. Using the terms high and low to describe relative concentration of molecules, fill out the chart for the different energy source availabilities. So before we go ahead and fill this out, I think we just need to go over some theory again. Okay, so you know... What you should know is that glucose and, C and cyclic AMP levels are inversely proportional. Okay, so that means if you have high glucose, you have low cyclic AMP. So there's biochemical reasons behind this. I don't think you need to know it for this course. Just know and remember that they're inversely proportional. Okay, so cyclic AMP is a very important molecule. It's a second messenger in a lot of different pathways, but for this one, cyclic AMP binds and can bind to the CAP, or catabolite activated protein. Now, you may also see this CAP written as CRP, which is also known as C cyclic AMP receptor protein. Okay, but here I'm calling it CAP, catabolite activated protein. Okay, so when it binds here, the complex, the CAP cyclic AMP complex, It binds to a site upstream of the LAC promoter and facilitates transcription. So, binds upstream helps transcription. Okay, so when glucose levels are low, cyclic AMP levels are high, and therefore the complex levels are high, and transcription of the LAC operon is going on. It's expressed and the cell becomes equipped to metabolize an, al an alternative energy source, right? Because the glucose is low and the cell needs energy. Okay, so when glucose is available, let's go and fill out this chart. In the first line, glucose is available. So remember, if glucose is high, cyclic AMP is going to be low. 
Now, if cyclic AMP is low, then the cyclic AMP CAP complex is also going to be low. And remember that this complex aids, facilitates transcription. So if it's low, and also, you know, you're using glucose, so you don't need to utilize lactose, um, the operon isn't going to be ex expressed very efficiently. So here, it says, the third column says lactose permease. Now, remember lactose permease, this is LACY. And as I said in an earlier problem, um, a lot of these problems are just going to say, you know, what's the concentration of lactose permease, or what's the concentration of beta-galactoside. Um, that just means what is happening with the expression of the operon. Is it, is it high expression? Is it not being expressed? So if transcription isn't being facilitated because the cyclic AMP CIP complex is low, then the relative um, concentration of lactose permease, one of the structural genes, is also going to be low. Okay. Now for now, I'm going to jump to the lactose only column, okay? So if lactose is there, glucose we don't have any, right, in this third column. So if glucose is low, cyclic AMP is going to be high, and therefore the complex is going to be high, and therefore that complex is going to facilitate transcription so that the concentration of the structural genes of lac are also going to be high. Now the reason why I skipped is because a lot of students, you know, may get tripped up if there's multiple sources available. So if glucose and lactose are both in the mix, you may think, okay, well lactose is going to be in the cell, so it's going, allolactose is going to bind to the repressor, inactivating it, and turning on this lac operon. But that doesn't happen, and this is because this mechanism, including the second messenger, second messenger cyclic AMP kind of prevents that. So again, remember that glucose is the preferred energy supply of E. coli. So if glucose is around at all, they're going to use that up before they go into any other available source. So if you go across, this column is actually going to be identical to the column of if there was just glucose in the mix. Okay, so glucose is there, cyclic AMP is going to be low, complex is going to be low, transcription is going to be low. So until that glucose is used up and there's only lactose left, then you go into the third column and everything switches, okay? So just remember that the E. coli likes to use glucose first before it utilizes this lac operon. Problem four. Any gene in the lac operon can undergo mutations that lead to a loss of function. Predict the phenotype of the following mutants, choosing from the four choices below. So this question is going to really dig in deep into the details of what each part of the LAC operon functions as. Okay, so the four choices that we're going to use for phenotype choices are going to be either one, the LAC operon will be expressed only in the presence of lactose, two, the LAC operon will be expressed only in the absence of lactose, three, the LAC operon will be constitutively expressed, or four, the LAC operon will never be expressed efficiently. Okay, so the first mutation we're going to look at is mutation in the LAC I gene. So remember, under normal conditions, the LAC I gene, sorry about that. So the LAC I gene encodes for the repressor protein, right? It's outside of the operon, it's upstream, has a different promoter, and encodes for the repressor protein. Now that repressor protein under normal condition binds to the operator and blocks transcription unless it is inactivated by binding allolactose, okay? It's only inactivated in the presence of lactose. So if a lac I mutant occurs, that means that this repressor is going to be inactive from the get-go, even if it's not bound to allolactose, okay? So a mutant repressor is going to be inactive. So if an inactive repressor protein cannot bind the operator, and therefore the lac operon can't be, it won't be turned off, right? It'll be on because the operator is free and RNA polymerase can go down and transcribe the rest of the operon. So operon will be free. Let me just, I just want to write it down so that if you look back later, um, you can see the answer. So the operator 
will not be blocked. And the operon will be on. Now, of the four choices here for phenotype, we're going to choose option number three. The lac operon will be constitutively expressed. So under normal conditions, this lac I, the lac I gene, the repressor protein, responds to the amount of lactose in the cell and the amount of um, the other energy sources in the cell. And therefore, it's only on if lactose is present and only lactose is present. But here, a mutant lac I an inactive repressor will not will not respond to the different levels in the cell so the lac operon will just be constitutively expressed because remember an inactive repressor cannot bind to the operator okay so lac operon always expressed mutation 2 a merodiploid in which a wild-type copy of the lac I gene is introduced into the lac I mutant. Okay, so here, this term, merodiploid, it's really just a fancy term for a partial diploid. So a bacterium can have duplicate copies of some genes, but not the entire genome to make a full diploid. So in this case, this bacterium will have two copies of the lac I gene. It will have a wild-type copy, a normal functioning copy and the lac I mutant from part A, but then the rest of the lac operon genes will only have one copy, okay? So the gene product of lac I, as we said before, is a repressor protein. So I'm just going to write that down one more time, including the word protein. So if this merodiploid cell has a wild-type copy of the lac I gene, it's going to express the normal functioning repressor protein. And even though the lac I mutant is still there and it's going to make a non-functioning, you do have an active functioning repressor protein in the mix. Okay, so that gene product is diffusible and it's transacting. So you may hear it in the, um, the theory videos trans and cis and cis acting, but we'll, we'll talk about it in further problems as well. So this I'm going to say diffusible transacting element. So that means that the wild type repressor that's made from this wild type gene cop copy that's put into this mutant, it will be able to bind to the operator in the chromosomal copy of the lac operon and, and block transcription in the absence of lactose just like, nor le just like it normally would. So it restores the normal phenotype which is where the lac genes are only expressed in the presence of lactose. So that is phenotype option number one. Okay, so I'll write that up here as well. In this option number one, the lac operon will be expressed only in the presence of lactose. That's the wild type, um, normal functioning lac operon phenotype, okay? So, and I could draw it for you here. So if we have the normal lac operon, this will be I, somewhere down, promoter, operator, and then ZYA. Now here, this is the mutation that isn't working. But then you have a second copy over here of just the I gene that's wild type. Okay, so when these genes are transcribed, this wild type lac I gene is going to make the repressor molecule. I'll just draw it as a circle. Okay, and this repressor protein Oops. can go ahead and block the operator on the chromosomal copy of the lac operon. Okay, so it's diffusible, it's transacting, um, it doesn't have to be on that the copy of the operon to act on it, okay? Part C. Lac IS, super repressor mutant, in which the synthesized repressor protein cannot bind the inducer. Okay, so what does this mean? If a repressor molecule can't bind the inducer, that means that its conformation won't change at all, right? It won't change in response to lactose being in the cell because it cannot bind allolactose. So a super repressor, this is not a mutation that makes it unable to bind to the promoter. 
So a can bind promoter, I mean, I'm sorry, the operator, can bind to operator, cannot bind allolactose. Okay, so what this means is that this repressor protein will always be bound to the operator. because it's always going to be in its active state because the inducer cannot inactivate it. So it will always be bound to the operator, always binding RNA polymerase from transcribing the operator, the operon, and therefore the operon will always be off. Okay, so this is phenotype choice number four. But the lac operon will never be expressed efficiently because the super repressor protein won't detach from the operator and will always bind, uh, always block transcription. So this is choice number four. Part D. A marrow diploid in which a wild type copy of the lac I gene is introduced into the lac I S mutant from part C. So even if this is another, remember that the repressor protein, even if it's mutated, if it's a super repressor or if it's a normal repressor, it's transacting, mean, meaning that the protein can diffuse and act on any of the lac operons that are present in the genome. So even if you introduce a wild copy of the lac I gene that just makes the normal copy lac I repressor, you still have this super repressor. I'm going to draw it as a bigger green circle. So that equals lac I super, the super repressor. Even if you introduce a normal type copy, that lac I super repressor is still going to bind to an operator. And when it does bind to that operator, it's never going to detach because it can't bind to the inducer. Okay, so even though in part B, when you added in the wild type copy, it did fix and it did go back to the normal phenotype. This one is not going to go back to the normal phenotype. So it's still going to be phenotype choice 4, where operator, the operon is always going to be off. Okay, so in this case, the duplicate gene does not restore the normal phenotype because the super repressor mutation in this case is dominant. So let me write that. And that's not to say dominant, meaning the other, the wild type won't be expressed. It will be expressed. It's just that the super repressor will dictate the phenotype, okay? And it has, that's why it's dominant here. Okay, part E. OC, operator mutant, in which the, the operator cannot bind the repressor. So here, this means that everything else is normal. You have a normal lac I gene. So you're making the normal repressor protein, but in this case, the operator itself is actually mutated and it can't bind the repressor. So what, remember, what a repressor normally does, it acts as, you know, the on-off. So if lactose is not present in the cell, the repressor is going to bind to the operator to block transcription and the operon will be off. But here, this, operon, this operator cannot bind the repressor protein. So that means that the operon will always be on. because the operator will always be free of a repressor protein. And this means that the lac genes will be constitutively expressed. And that was choice number three, phenotype number three, where the lac genes will always be on, okay? And finally, part F is a lac P mutant. So remember that lac P, this is Sometimes it's just written as P, other times written as um, lac P. This is just the promoter sequence. Okay. Now, a promoter, a mutated promoter, could not be recognized by RNA polymerase, so the binding and transcription could never occur, even if the repressor is inactivated and glucose is absent and the cell needs to utilize lactose. This operon will never 
be turned on efficiently because the promoter sequence is mutated and therefore RNA polymerase cannot come over and transcribe the operon. So RNA polymerase, polymerase cannot recognize this mutated sequence. and therefore the operon will never be efficiently expressed. And that again is phenotype number choice four. Okay, so this digs in a little deeper into what each of the parts of the LAC operon does. So you know that the LAC I gene encodes for the repressor protein that is normally active and binds to the promoter unless lactose is present and changes the conformation of it. Uh, the promoter is the sequence that RNA polymerase can recognize and can start transcription. The operator is what the repressor protein binds to and that can block RNA polymerase if the repressor is there. And then you have the structural genes which we'll get into a little bit later um, but you know that they encode for the cleavage enzyme, the lactose permease, the cell membrane enzyme, and then also that transacetylase enzyme. Okay, so that concludes this problem. Problem five. Professor Smith is studying E. coli in the lab and needs help forming a hypothesis. He plans on plating bacterial cells on medium containing lactose as the only energy source. If he utilizes a breakthrough technique that mutates only the LACY gene, leading to a loss of function of the gene product, 10 minutes after plating, what would you predict would happen to the cells? Assume the cells cannot use lactose breakdown products for energy, and be sure to include details from your knowledge of the LAC operon. Okay, so let's talk about what's going to happen before he uses the, break te the breakthrough technique. Okay, so let's say before mutation, What's going on? He's plating the bacteria on medium that only contains lactose, so there's no glucose around, which is the preferred energy source. And therefore, lactose is going to be entering the cell, and the cell needs to utilize it as, as, as an energy source. So before the mutation, the lac operon is going to be turned on. Right? Because you'll have lactose isomerizing to allolactose binding to the repressor protein, inactivating it, freeing up the operator, and therefore RNA polymerase can go and transcribe the LAC operon structural genes. So the LAC operon will be on LAC Z, LAC Y, and LAC A will all be expressed. And the cell is utilizing lactose as an energy source. Now, 10 minutes after plating, he uses this breakthrough technique that only mutates the LAC Y gene, and it cuts out the function of this gene product. So after mutation, what's going to happen? Well, the LAC Y gene is efficiently, uh, effectively deleted here. So remember that the LAC Y encodes for lactose permease, which is the enzyme that travels to the cell membrane and, transport lact and transports lactose into the cell. So if you no longer have this, what's going to happen? Well, for the first 10 minutes, the cell was transcribing LACY, so lactose permease, permease was <coughs> in the cell membrane transporting lactose in. So there's still some lactose inside of the cell. So for a few minutes, I don't know, it de really depends on um, rate of cell division, how quickly these cells are using up the energy, but we'll say after a short time, the lactose is going to be used up, right? The lactose that was already in the cell. Now, this is not how it actually works. But this question is asking you to assume that the cells can't use the lactose breakdown products for energy. So once all the lactose is used up, the cells are going to die, right? Because they've exhausted their supply of an energy source. So the lactose will be used up and you no longer 
getting lactose in from the environment. So it doesn't matter how much lactose he puts on these medium, on these plates, because lactose permease isn't working and it's not going to be able to take any of that into the cell. Okay, so after a few minutes, so in conclusion, basically before the technique is used, everything's normal. It's a normal phenotype of the LAC operon being turned on in the presence of lactose. And after mutation, the cell will continue to be normal until it uses up its source supply of the lactose within the cell. And after that, the cells will die because they can no longer get in any energy source from the environment. Problem six. In bacterial genetics, a plus symbol represents wild type. The following merodiploid strains have two different alleles of the A locus, either A1 or A2. For the genotypes given, determine whether both, just one, or neither allele will be expressed in the presence of lactose. Okay, so for this first part, you see that they're merodiploid because they only have, they have copies, two copies of the LAC operon, but the rest of the genome isn't duplicated, okay? So that's why it's still merodiploid. So if you look at the first copy of the LAC operon, you have a wild type LAC I, wild type promoter, wild type operon, and then you have the A1 allele. And the other copy of the operon, you have a mutated LAC I normal promoter, normal operator, and the A2 allele. So remember that LAC I encodes for the repressor protein. So this is going to give a mutated repressor protein. So if this copy of the LAC operon was the only one that was in the cell, you wouldn't have a repressor protein and therefore it would, the transcription would be occurring all the time. But because it's a merodiploid, you have another copy here that's normal. So it's going to encode that normal repressor protein, which I've been drawing as just a red circle. Now remember that repressor proteins are transacting elements. So because you have that one copy of the wild type black eye, that is enough to give the normal phenotype of, of lactose, okay? So remember that this problem is asking us for the phenotype in the presence of lactose, okay? So a normal phenotype of the lac operon in the presence of lactose means that the operon is going to be on. And because it's a transacting element, both copies of the operon will be turned on, and therefore both A1 and A2 will be expressed. Okay. For part B, the first copy of the operon, you have wild type black eye, a mutated promoter, wild type operator, and A1 allele. Then in the second copy, you have wild type black eye, wild type promoter, wild type operator, and A2. So again, we're looking in the presence of lactose. So for this one, you know, both black eye genes are wild type, so you will have this normal um, repressor protein that responds to the uh, amount of lactose in the cell. So for the second copy on the right, this will definitely be expressed in the presence of lactose, right? Because it's just a normal copy of the operon. So A2 is definitely going to be expressed. But what about A1? If you look, LAC I binds to the operator, so there's no problem with the binding, and there's no problem with the repressor protein responding to allolactose levels. But in this case, the mutation is in the promoter. Now, a promoter is a cis-acting element. which means that it only affects the operon copy that it itself is a part of. It only affects what's downstream of it because it's not like the, the promoter isn't encoding for a gene that makes a protein that can move to either copy of the operon. It's actually part of the operon. So it's cis-acting. It affects only the operon copy it's a part of. And a non-functional promoter means that RNA polymerase cannot bind to it, right? Because it can't recognize. So 
this operon on the left is not going to be transcribed. So A1, the A1 allele, isn't going to be transcribed, and only the A2 allele will be expressed in the presence of lactose. So even in the absence of lactose, either, either way, A1, the A1 allele, never expressed. Okay, part C, you have the first copy of the operon is wild type at I, promoter, op operator, and then it has A1. And then on your right, you see LAC normal, LAC I, normal promoter, a mutated operator, and then the A2 allele. So operator, again, just like the promoter, is also cis-acting, meaning it only affects the, oper the operon that it is a part of. And what is the purpose of the operator? Remember that it is the on-off switch, so it can either bind to the repressor or it can not bind to the repressor, freeing up the operon for transcription. So a mutated operon probably won't, if we're saying it's a loss of function, it won't be able to bind the repressor protein, okay? So this copy on the right, even though there are two wild-type copies of the repressor protein, this operator cannot respond to it. And therefore, this operator will always be free, and RNA polymerase can always go past and transcribe the structural genes downstream of it. So I'm putting this in red because this one will always be expressed in the presence or the absence of lactose. So regardless of lactose levels. Okay, so this is the A2 allele will always be expressed. Now, the reason why I'm just separating that out is because the question is asking us for the phenotype in the presence of lactose. So this first copy is just a normal wild type copy of the operon. So A1 will be expressed in the presence of lactose, but it won't be expressed in the absence. Okay, so I just wanted to differentiate because in the presence of lactose, both A1 and A2 are going to be expressed, but in the absence of lactose, you would still get the expression of A2. Okay, so that's just um, another little dig into the details of the different elements of the lac operon.